Hey there, Nico here from Zambezi Flora once again. Um, we're back for another bush trek through that little bit of Miombo woodland around Lusaka. Um, it's been about a month since the last video, um, although I have been here since that time, um, but it was really hot and dry. There was very little that was actually up and growing at that point in time, but um, we've now had a bit more rains. There are things now starting to push up. And um, let's get going and have a, uh, have a look at what we find. So kind of at the end of the last video, I highlighted an epiphytic orchid that was going to be blooming shortly. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, Satorchus crassifolius. Um, just kind of out of the reach. Um, I'm actually six foot, near six foot five, and this one is just kind of getting up there a little too tall for me. Um, but one can just make out that the... Uh, the flowers are now fully open. Actually, some of them have gone over. You know, I kind of miss the best flowering period on it. Um, I've come across this actually mostly up in northern parts of Zambia and more high rainfall areas. Um, but that said, this specimen here is probably the largest of it that I've ever seen. Um, normally, they're much kind of smaller. Um, both in leaf characteristics and usually singular rather than clumped as this one is here. Um, but these uh, fantastic white flowers obviously attracting some kind of uh, pollinating moth at night um, when they are fragrant actually, yeah, the fragrance comes out at night. But um, a lovely, lovely epiphytic orchid. Um, I wish I would actually knew of more around Lusaka because it's a shame to only have one of these kind of clumps here. This is the um, very conspicuous fireball lily, one of the two species that we have in Zambia referred to commonly as the fireball lily. This is Buffone discidia, or discia, sorry. Um, easier to tell apart than the other one. As the leaves come out, they're quite uh, linear, um, sometimes lanceolate, very leathery. Uh, this one tends to grow more in woodland clearings. So here the trees have kind of uh, opened up a little bit and this guy has established himself. Um, beautiful plant when the flowers, because this guy is just basically faded now, um, probably due to the heat actually that we've had lately, but when the, um, the flowers fade, the pedicels, as you can see here, start to expand. Um, they get quite big, you know, maybe upwards of about a foot and a half to two feet across. And then the um, inflorescence part, just at the, the top where the peduncle or the scape uh, joins the inflorescence, it breaks off and this tumbles down the grasslands areas, um, spreading the seed that way. Um, a very beautiful species. Uh, not always the easiest to grow actually um, and they take a long time from seed to reach flowering size. Um, I've been growing it for a few years and my plants are still not flowering um, from which I've started from seed but then I notice kind of right beside it oh we have a little Tolbagia here this is Tolbagia leucantha um, very similar in appearance to Tolbagia eliacea However, um, the pseudocorona, the little orange bit there sticking out, tends to be uh, longer in Leucantha than in Aliacea. And the um, perianth segments, the petals, if you will, will uh, kind of recurve as the flowers are fully open. So you can see some of them are recurving there. But um, fantastic to see this one, these two together. Um, and just proof that uh, the rains are now here and things are really starting to kick off. So here we have uh, Cyanotus fecunda, I think. Um, I find some of the Comalinaceae species actually quite difficult to identify. Um, but these kind of bluey purple flowers um, with the uh, stamens having these little hairs that come off of them, giving this nice little fuzzy kind of appearance. Um, usually kind of small members of the, uh, the family, not getting too tall. Um, 
related to the more well-known, especially in the uh, northern temperate climates, the Tratascantia group. These guys kind of come up early season, um, and sometimes actually have quite a long flowering period from the early to mid rains, um, and just kind of give a nice little shot of color, um, that kind of bluish color at this time of year. The uh, Dolichos kilimans, kilimans dericus, ah, I always have a hard time pronouncing the name, sorry, um, subspecies of the same name, um, sometimes referred to as kind of like the wild lupin here in Zambia. Um, shoots up very, very early. Also, as the rains just start to begin, got these uh, fantastic purplish flowers. Uh, the sun is not really working in my favor at the moment. Um, it's, it's quite early, got to come out quite early at the, at the time just to at least avoid some of the heat of the day. Um, sends up the stalks. Uh, initially, the leaves will then start to appear. You can just kind of see um, the starting of the leaves down here at the base of the plant. Um, uh, very conspicuous when these guys are in full flower, when these uh, stalks are just completely open with flowers. This guy is just kind of starting. Um, maybe we'll come across another one uh, as we walk about still. Um, that's in proper full flower, but uh, a fantastic plant in the early season um, and a great uh, one to come across. This member of the grape family um, is in the genus Cyphostema. This is Cyphostema juncium, uh, named for its kind of uh, thin, I guess, junkest looking leaves, which doesn't exactly kind of make sense to me. Maybe also because it's a very slight plant in comparison to many other members uh, of the genus within the family. Uh, this guy has already gone through the fruits, or the, the flower, sorry, and the kind of little grape-like fruits are now ripening. Um, hopefully we'll come across one that's in flower. Um, and these fruits ripen very, very early. It flowers really early, fruits really early, and these seeds will germinate the same season. Whereas other members of the, uh, of the genus will flower and fruit later and the, and the seeds will then um, require a dormancy over the dry season before they germinate. But uh, fantastic food plant for birds and other wildlife. We've got some of these uh, interesting kind of beetles on here. Not exactly sure what those guys are, but they seem to be uh, enjoying themselves. So hopefully we come across another one of these guys in flower. Here we have the flowers of that Cyphostema juncium. Um, I don't even know if I'm actually going to be able to zoom in or at least to focus on these well enough. But absolutely uh, minute little flowers possibly about three or so millimeters across. You see, uh, it's also got some insect life on it. Um, now all the Cyphostema flowers are pretty small like this. You know, they're, uh, obviously they have their differences in terms of different species giving different flowers. Um, but the, are not exceedingly um, ornamental florally, but then obviously in terms of the, the shape of the plant, um, especially with these leaves coming out, this kind of uh, reddish purple color in the early season, um, and then sometimes actually getting kind of more of a, a bluish gray um, bloom on it afterwards makes this species actually quite attractive. Um, I have collected seeds and I am growing it to introduce it to the farm, um, as well as with a few other different Cyphostema species I've come across as well. Um, but very kind of nice architectural plants. It's, uh, it seems a little early for this little one to be up and, uh, up and blooming already. Um, I think this is uh, Aspilia pluriceta, subspecies pluriceta, in the Asteraceae family. I'm not all that uh, strong on Asteraceae. It's a very big family. Um, but these lovely little uh, yellow ray florets kind of make it stand out. Um, it's a very short plant at the moment. I would expect to see it 
a little uh, later once the rains have properly set in, but maybe there's a bit of a, uh, um, an area that got quite a bit of rain here, which has kind of kicked this guy into growth a little earlier. Um, fire is a natural part of the Miombo woodland system. Here we have an area that has been burnt. And actually, it's, it's been burnt fairly recently. There's a, a little section over there where you can actually see um, a trunk that is still uh, smoldering, you know, a dead trunk at that, not anything that was brought down by the fire. Um, ideally, fires in the early part of the dry season are best. They usually don't burn as, uh, as hot. Um, they're less destructive, they're very patchy, whereas here you can see that this has just pretty much just gone through everything. Um, it's also affected the new leaves on the, uh, the taller trees. Um, a lot of them, especially those that are not at the very top of the canopy, have been singed. Um, so these trees will have to reshoot again. Uh, anything on the ground, and even though this uh, little one didn't get burnt itself, you can see that all of these new leaves are now basically crispy. You know, ideally this thing will have to, uh, to reshoot out and um, put more energy into growing more leaves. But um, late season fires are definitely more destructive than, uh, than those from earlier in the season, ideally May-June, um, to keep it to a cooler temperature and, and remove some of the uh, undergrowth, but not all of it, whereas this basically has just removed everything. The other fireball lily species that we have in Zambia is Scadexus multiflorus, subspecies multiflorus. This guy has just opened. He's actually almost in perfect flower at the moment, and if I put my hand over top of it, yeah, I get all the, the pollen spreading onto my hand. Um, so this differs from the first one that we came across. Um, Principally in that actually the bulb is below ground. I didn't actually point that out in the last um, in the Buffone species where the neck of the bulb actually sticks up above ground quite a bit. Um, in Scaduxus the bulb is completely underground. The inflorescence is similar but um, when the fruits are ripened uh, it doesn't elongate and form that kind of uh, tumbleweed structure. Instead, this guy produces uh, green berries that then ripen to an orange or red color and are bird dispersed. And the leaves as well. So these leaves are much broader. They don't quite form um, a fan shape. Uh, and they actually develop uh, somewhat of a pseudo stem. So the actual uh, leaf um, shoot can, can get quite tall and then it has these kind of um, the, the way that the leaves attach into the plant give the appearance kind of, of a pseudo stem um, for, for the habit but um, it is a very conspicuous plant just like the buffone is um, and and when you kind of know the differences to look for you can easily tell the two apart Quite a number of um, our indigenous figs here in Zambia kind of start their lives as uh, stranglers. And this one does not seem to be any exception. Um, obviously it got started on the trunk of, uh, of this guy here, on one of the trunks of this guy here, which is the Brachistesia, um, and eventually strangled him. And now that trunk is almost completely gone. I think this is uh, Ficus burkii. Um, also known as Kachele in one of the vernacular languages. Um, and uh, just one of the components of the woodland here. We've got a range of uh, sedge species in Zambia, from the very small, as this type is here, through to quite large um, species. Uh, I'm not really sure what this species is. I'll see if I can't uh, find the name and put it on here. But um, the uh, white florets are actually quite a striking little feature of this guy, but you definitely have to be walking over him to see him. Here is the uh, tumbleweed structure of the fireball species Buffone discia. You can see that the, uh, the pedestals have actually expanded quite a bit. Um, where fruits have 
formed. You got the, the swollen ones here. Um, when this thing is fully ready, as I say, it'll break off just at the attachment point underneath here. And then you can just imagine this thing rolling across the uh, forest or, or grassland floor as the, um, as the wind blows it. Um, and every now and then when it gets stuck or as these little guys break off, the seed falls out and poof, you've got the plant potentially able to grow in a new area. Oh, and then just on this other side here, we have another species of Cyphostemma. I think this is a Cyphostemma, Ooh, actually I'm not sure to tell you the truth. It looks a little like Rhodesiae, but I can't be 100% certain. This guy is much, much bigger. Um, you know, this is at least getting up to about a, a meter and a half tall. We've got again the, uh, the quite small flowers here on these inflorescences. Here's the, um, the little fruit that's starting to develop on this guy. Um, and again, the birds will disperse this when those fruit ripen to, uh, to a kind of a purpley black color. Here we've got a fantastic specimen of the uh, foxglove orchid that's flowering just on this uh, access road. You can kind of see on the other side where the fire has gone through that side. Um, this is uh, Yelofia cuculata. Um, and it comes up, yeah, just as the rains begin um, with these fantastic large flowers. I don't know if I can focus really well into that. Um, most likely pollinated by uh, larger bees, bumblebees and the like. Um, and uh, very widespread across Zambia. You know, I've come across this all the way from the northeast to the northwest. And then obviously down into uh, southern parts, kind of like we are here around Lusaka. Um, the flower stalk will come up first, the leaves will follow then afterwards, um, and easily spotted from a distance. Um, I saw this oh, maybe from about 50 meters away and, and just had to come over because it's in such a nice condition. Um, quite a, a decent stalk on this with uh, still more flowers to open. Um, a great one for kind of uh, light woodlands and grassland habitats. Here's another little uh, orchid species, early flowering. This is uh, Orthochylus euanthus, these kind of white nodding flowers. They don't open too wide. Um, this used to be classified as uh, Eulophia euantha, but um, taxonomic revisions and all, now it's an Orthochylus species again. Um, it produces these uh, lovely kind of white sprays, sometimes tinged with pink, then with that kind of darker throat, as you can see there. Um, it shoots up its flower stalk first. This one actually looks like it's got another flower stalk coming, so... And then the, the leaf is also just starting to come up here. Um, this is not as common as the previous orchid, the Eulophia cuculata that we came across, um, and usually prefers kind of uh, slightly more shade in woodlands. Um, and here we've got like a little uh, Brachistesia seedling kind of growing up next to it. We'll see if that one ever develops into a larger tree. And then I just actually see right beside it, we've got some of the, um, the seeds of one of the, uh, the Proteaceae family members here. I think this is a Phorea, Phorea um, seed. So there's obviously uh, a tree nearby to be dropping these guys. So I actually might collect these and see if I can't uh, germinate them and, and try and uh, grow that back at the farm. We've got um, a Califa brachiata just starting to uh, throw up its inflorescences here. This is a member of Euphorbiaceae. Um, a lot of people will be more common, commonly acquainted with the um, succulent Euphorbia, but uh, this is one of the little uh, herbaceous Spe um, genera. Um, this guy can grow up to quite a bit tall, upwards of two meters, um, perennial from a kind of a woody root. Uh, the flowers are not 
fully out yet. They'll have um, kind of a reddish look to them when they are open, but uh, just starting to grow. So nice to see him. And then right next to it, we actually do have a euphorbia. This is also herbaceous euphorbia. Um, pretty sure this is a euphorbia otii, um, but it won't be flowering for a little while longer. I've been walking by a number of clumps of this uh, little hypoxis, but none of the plants were in flower, and finally I've come across one. This is uh, Hypoxis goatsii, sometimes also known as the African potato. It grows from a kind of uh, potato-like tuberous root. Um, these guys basically only open when the sun is shining. On an overcast day or on a rainy day, these flowers are shut, waiting for uh, sunnier days to come before they open. Um, bright yellow flowers early in the season. They'll continue flowering even as the leaves, which are just starting to emerge back here, start to, uh, to really kind of um, spread out. Um, and a, a fantastic early season um, bright color. In one of my previous videos, I highlighted the, uh, the flowers of um, the species Lania edulis. Um, this is a Suffertex species usually doesn't grow very tall. This one is obviously in a more protected area, so it's able to, uh, to form above ground woody stems, but um, can usually actually be burnt back below ground and then reshoots every year um, from the woody root underground. Um, these have little edible fruits. I don't know if I can really think the sun is working in my favor at the moment. Um, Grape-like. Um, oh, I don't see, I, don't, I can't seem to get it focused, unfortunately. A different angle, maybe. There we go. Um, these are edible fruits. Nice and, uh, and ripe now. A little bit of a sweet taste. Not very strong. Um, Kind of reminiscent a bit of a grape, but not, not hugely. Um, but definitely if you're walking in the woodlands and it's hot and dry, and these were uh, ripe, at least it would be something to kind of uh, chew on and, and quench a bit of the thirst. Here we have uh, an Ochna species. Now, this has finished flowering. The, uh, the yellow flowers come out fairly early, are quite short-lived but then they are replaced by the, um, the kind of pinkish to red bracts and the, um, the fruits. You can see a few of them are ripening, turning uh, kind of purpley black. Oops, sorry. Let me get this focus there. Yeah, so they're turning uh, purplish black and are ready to be dispersed. But even then, in fruit, this thing is quite ornamental with those uh, colored bracts. So I might actually collect some of these uh, ripe seeds and, uh, and also see about trying to get this growing and, and spread around the farm. The genus Chlorophytum is, uh, is quite well represented in Zambia. I can't remember exactly how many species there are, but they actually can be quite variable. Here we've got a, one of the sort of more nondescript members of the genus. This is uh, Chlorophytum blatherophyllum. There's a few varieties or subspecies. I'm not sure exactly which one this is. Um, but uh, it has these kind of bell-shaped, um, brownish to kind of dull yellowy flowers. Uh, they don't open very widely. Um, they blend in actually quite well with the grassland, with the, the dry grasses at the moment. Um, and there are actually quite a number of other species that I have come across in this little bit of uh, miombo here, but they're not up and flowering at the moment. Um, this guy has escaped being burnt. The fire just kind of stopped right here. And actually, as I've been walking further around, I think what has happened is that the cattle at this uh, farm have been ranged in the last little while, and they've trampled quite a bit of the, uh, the dry grasses and um, other dry material. So what you have is the fire hasn't actually been able to just spread through 
um, at a crazy fast speed. It's just kind of crawled along the surface, burning up a bit of the dry grasses and um, leaving patched areas where not everything has been burned or where it misses it all together. But this little uh, chlorophytum has definitely escaped the fire this year. I just need to point out how um, the color of things can kind of catch your eye. And, and I was just walking by some distance away and these uh, emerging leaves from one of the Brachystesia species really caught my eye with that um, kind of rusty orange um, color to them. Um, lovely feathery kind of look to it and, and nature to it just as these guys start to emerge. Um, it is just, you know, a wash of color, but sometimes from things that you don't necessarily expect. So we've got our second epiphytic orchid. Here is Arangus verdicii, subspecies verdicii. Again, this guy's a little out of my reach. Maybe I'll come across another one that is uh, lower down on the stem. But this guy's just in full flower, looking stunning at the moment. We've got giant land snails in the, the Miombo, and I've never actually come across any of these guys that are living. I always seem to come across the, uh, the bleached out shells, but this is quite large, you know, three to four inches long, maybe two or so wide. Um, a lot of work into creating this, and now I suppose the, uh, the snail that used to call this home is, is probably dead. But he leaves quite the, uh, the little monument. I've just stumbled across another little uh, ground orchid. This is a Eulophia of some sort. I'm not 100% sure what species it is, mind you. So I'll uh, probably take a flower to see if I can't identify it back at the, ho at the house. Um, actually, as I was walking back, I noticed this tuft of leaves, which is um, quite reminiscent of an orchid, or at least a petaloid monocot. And then, just looking over to the side, you come across this little guy here. So, that's quite a nice little find. Um, the uh, erect sepals, petals lying partially over the column. And a nice little mark on the lip. Hopefully it should be pretty easy to identify. This is a rather nondescript uh, member of Asparagaceae, formerly Hyacinthaceae. This is uh, Dipcati viridi. Um, these flowers do not stand out at all. You literally have to stumble across it to notice it. Um, but obviously of interest to some insect life. We've got some kind of insect just sitting on one of the flowers. Not sure, it kind of looks like a cricket type of insect to me. Um, but produces these uh, greenish brown flowers. Um, you've got these kind of long tepal appendages. Um, most members of this genus are green flowered, not very big. I've highlighted um, one of the more interesting ones in, in one of my was blooming videos at the nursery, which um, is Dipcati platyphyllum with the kind of wider leaf with the um, undulate or wavy margins to the edge. This guy just has grass-like leaves. Uh, nothing is emerging out yet. Oh, no, I'm wrong. You've just got a leaf starting to emerge, um, but it essentially will basically just look like grass when it is up and growing. So these guys are uh, not a very commonly spotted constituent of the woodland, um, but are there nonetheless. This is a uh, little Triumphetta, Triumphetta wellwichii, now in the Malvaceae family, used to be in Tiliaceae. It has these nice bright yellow flowers, the uh, resulting seed pods will be quite like roundish with these little uh, hair type structures coming off of them, um, which is also quite attractive actually. Um, there are a number of uh, Triumphetta species in Zambia, some reaching fairly decent sized shrubs, but this is one of the little uh, herbaceous types growing from um, 
I don't know if it's a woody root, but growing, it's, it is perennial, um, coming up and flowering before most other things really get growing. And just over near the triumphetta, we've got a little thunbergia that's up and flowering already. Nice kind of dark purple, almost velvety um, petals on this guy. I'm not sure exactly which of the species. Again, um, Acanthaceae is not the strongest suit of mine. My interest is more in the petaloid monocots. Um, but I'll see if I can't uh, identify this guy and, and put him on. But uh, his flower color definitely stands out. We've not come across anything so far today that has that same kind of nice uh, velvety dark purple color. Got another fruit tree here. This is a uh, Zaminia caffra, I do believe. Um, produces these, uh, well, what, plum, slightly slight, smaller than a plum sized or, or large grape sized fruits that ripen through to uh, an orangey color. This is called the sour plum for a fantastic reason, as these fruits are exceedingly sour. You know, you pop it in your mouth, you get a hint of uh, almond flavor for the first millisecond or so, and then poof, the, the sour hits you. And it is just, well, you, you cannot really uh, stomach too many of these fruits um, in, in one go. Again, kind of a nice fruit just to uh, wet your mouth if you've been walking through the woodland and it's hot and dry. But other than that, not really all that edible. This might not look like much, but this is actually quite exciting for me. Because this is the first time I've seen this epiphytic orchid growing here in this woodland. I've come across this more in northern parts of uh, Zambia. This is uh, Tridactyly tridentata. It has these narrow, kind of more roundish leaves. The other Tridactyly species in this uh, woodland is Bicaudata. Um, it won't flower until March. This guy probably would have already flowered. There is remnants of a seed pod, most likely from last year. Um, and I can't really tell if any of these uh, inflorescence stalks are from this year or not. But quite exciting to actually find this here. So that's a new one to add to the list of species that exist in this uh, bit of Brachistegia woodland here. There's a bit of a compare and contrast versus the, um, the Tridactyly tridentata that I just kind of found. Here we have Tridactyly bicaudata. Um, the more upright habit isn't um, a distinguishing feature as Tridentata can also be upright, even though the one that we just saw was more pendulous. Um, what's much more apparent is the leaves. These are um, much, much broader. They are flatter too, although these would um, consider, can be considered to be conduplicate or, or folded as they, they form that kind of V-shape in cross-section if you were to, to, to cut the leaf straight down the middle. Um, the flowers will also be different. This is the wrong time of year for flowering. Um, but yeah, no, you, you can't confuse Tridentata and Bicaudata if one was to come across them in the bush. So here we have the Arangus verdicii, subspecies verdicii again. A little more in my reach now. They've got these long, lovely spurs with a slight corkscrew twist just towards the, uh, the end of it. Um, the white petals and white sepals and the white lip as well. Um, just a, a fantastically beautiful plant um, that always kind of comes out this uh, mid to late November, early December period. However, that's it for me today. The, uh, the weather is changing. Both the sky and the sounds are showing for rain. So hopefully that's actually gonna happen and we'll get a bit of a good downpour. As you can see, it still looks quite dry behind me. Um, although now there are quite a few more things starting to push up, obviously. Um, there were some things I hoped to come across, but uh, did not this time around. So hopefully in the next week or two, we'll get to, uh, to, to view those. Um, but if you like the video, please give us a thumbs up hit that uh, share button and subscribe. Um, what I've started to do is put um, a breakdown of the video in terms of the species we come across with uh, the timestamps in the description. So if you're more inclined to look for specific species that you want to see highlighted, 
have a look down in the description and um, cheers. We'll see you next time. So I'm just driving out. I'm on my way out. Here we are. But I just spotted this little clump of Costa Spectabilis. And hard not to stop and want to get these guys on film because they are such lovely little flowers at this time of year. You can just see a few more as they are popping up here. But such bright little flowers, very recognizable, stand out very well against the dry background. And just starting to come up, you can just see their leaves down below as they uh, will unfurl over the next week, two, three maybe. But yeah, just a nice little uh, end to today's trip, I think.